All right, welcome back everybody. Robert Breaker here with you. And I thought I'd come outside this week to, to do the sermon of the week. And of course I have to be in the hot sun so my eyes are squinty. But uh, I want to do the message today on a subject that, uh, well, over the last three, four months I've been getting some emails about and phone calls about and other things. And a lot of people have been asking this. And so I thought, well, well this will be a good time to, to just go through some scriptures and explain and talk about this subject. So we're going to talk about today, trusting, trusting, um, what it means to trust, trusting. And I want to talk about that today and explain to you what trust is. Uh, you'll remember, oh, I guess it's been a month or so now, maybe a little longer. I did a message entitled, What Are You Trusting In? And uh, that was a fun message for me because I got to get on my surfboard and paddle out and, and explain something that we use on our surfboard and how that was a good illustration of trust, the leash. And uh, I enjoyed that message a lot. But uh, I get a lot of people emailing and asking and saying, Brother Breaker, what does it mean to trust? How do you trust? I, I don't understand. Uh, there's some folks that I get contacted by from time to time that say, I want to get saved. I really want to get saved, but I'm struggling. I don't understand what it means to believe, to trust. Well, today I'm going to try to explain that to you from the scriptures. And we're going to talk about trusting. You know, the word trust appears 191 times in 188 verses in our King James Bible. That's in all of its forms, trusteth, trusting, trusted, and all of that. So the Bible talks a lot about trust. So let's get started today in Psalms chapter 62. And in Psalm 62, we'll take as our text, uh, beginning verse, verse 5 through 8. Psalm chapter 62, verse 5 says... My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. An expectation is a hope, and that kind of ties in with faith. Faith is a hope. Trusting is believing and hoping in something. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Verse 7, And God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. It's amazing, the word refuge. We're going to learn today about trust and what trust is. And one of the definitions of trust is to rely or to rest in something. So it's a refuge. To put your faith and your trust in Christ is to make Him your refuge. And what is a refuge? It's a place of rest. But there in verse 8, it says, Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us, Selah. So David knew a lot about trust. David understood what it means to believe, to trust, and how God was his salvation. Now, a lot of times he's talking about salvation. He's talking about physical salvation, physically saved from his enemies. But uh, we today, we're talking about spiritual salvation. We're talking about being saved from hell, save, saving of our souls. But he says, trust in Him at all times. What God wants from us is trust. What is trust? Well, I looked up trust in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, which I always do if I want to know a word. That's the best dictionary in the world to use, the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. Because Webster's would always go to a King James Bible and he would always give you examples of a definition of the word and it's used here in the Bible. So it's amazing. It's wonderful. Best dictionary you can get. And the Webster's 1828 Dictionary says, Trust, as a noun, is confidence. A reliance or a resting of the mind on the integrity, justice, friendship, or other sound principle. So it's a, a relying on something that has integrity and justice. It's placing your confidence in something completely. Full confidence. Now trusting as a, as a verb, according to the 1828 Webster's, is to place confidence in, to rely on, to commit to the care of. So it's a reliance. Trust is relying on something. Pretty much with all your being and all your heart, confidence, believing in something. Trusting is believing or having faith in someone or something. Relying on it, resting in it, going to it for your refuge. 
You know, it implies knowing something. How can you uh, believe in or have faith in or have confidence in something that you don't, don't know? <laughs> so you have to know something. Uh, there's a lot to be said about knowing something. Uh, Jesus said, lest they should hear and understand in their heart and be converted. You know, there's an understanding, there's a knowledge of what it is that your faith is to be in, according to the Bible. I brought this chair out today with me as an illustration of trust. We found this chair uh, after the hurricane. Uh, we found it at a Walmart parking lot, believe it or not, uh, just laying there in the parking lot. And I said, honey, what's that? We went out, no cars around. And we said, well, this is a nice chair. So we, we salvaged this chair from a parking lot. And you can see through this chair. But when I saw this chair, I looked at this chair and I said, that looks like to me a very good chair. A chair that I can rely on, that I can have confidence in. I think that if I sit in that chair, it will hold me up. I believe that chair is strong enough and well made, even though it's made out of this fabric you can see through. I said, I'm going to try it. I'm going to sit in it. I trust this chair enough to put my confidence and rely. And yes, sure enough, it holds me up. <laughs> so it's a good illustration of what faith or, or trust is. It's knowing something, but believing in what that thing is in the sense that you're relying on it, and now I'm resting. I figured today I'm going to be in the hot sun. I might as well sit down rather than stand. So I'm placing my faith, my rest, my reliance in this chair. I'm trusting this chair to hold me up. And it's my place of refuge. I can sit here and rest as I'm giving you this message. When I went to Bible school, we were told in Bible school the first day. First day of Bible school, we had orientation. And the first day in Bible school, I remember the president of the Bible school telling us, he said, I want you all to remember one thing. Your most important thing in this life, the most important thing, is your relationship with Jesus Christ. So make sure you read your Bible every day, you pray every day, you walk in the Spirit that you fulfill not the lust of the flesh, and do right and live right, and make sure you have a good relationship with Jesus Christ. And I thought about that. I thought about that a lot over the years, and how relationships are based upon trust. In order to have a relationship with someone, you have to trust that person. If you can't trust them, then you don't want to be around them. Uh, friends, you know, what kind of friend is a true friend that you can't trust? You have any friends that you don't trust? Do you, did you go out on the street and find some bum or some homeless person and say, hey, come on into my house, I'm going to work, but here's the key, you just do whatever you want and I'll see you when I get home. <laughs> I couldn't do that. I couldn't trust in a person like that because no doubt by the time I get home, they would have cleaned out the house, sold everything and probably went and, and, and sold it and, and bought drugs. Uh, a lot of people do that. So trust, a lot of people say trust is something that is earned. And that does make sense. You've got to get to know somebody in order to gain their trust. And they got to get to know you in order to gain their trust. And you've got to know each other and know one another. So trust is something that is, for a lot of people, hard to give. Because you've got to know whether or not, if you trust that person, if they will come through for you, if they will be a a, a person who cares for you, that you can place your confidence in. So when it comes to relationships, now, trust is essential to a relationship. God makes salvation to us understandable with relationships. In the Bible, salvation is like two things. It's like, number one, being born again. When we're saved, we're born again. Well, when you're born, you're born as a baby and you grow. Who takes care of you when you're a baby? Your parents. And so from an early age, the more you get to know your parents, who, who, by the way, do a lot of work for you, they change your diapers, they feed you, they change your diapers, they feed you. Changing diapers is disgusting. I'm sorry, but it's awful. But the older you get, you, you learn to trust your parents and you believe them. You believe whatever they say. Now you might get older and find out your parents are sinners. It might be hard to trust in them when you're older. But as a child, your faith, your trust is in that relationship with your parent, and you trust them, and that's good. And also getting married. In the Bible, we have getting married. Now, if you want to get married, then you go and you look for someone, and you pray and say, God, please send me the right husband or the right wife, 
And before you get married, you should take time there. Some people say you should take two years at least. Other people say at least six months. Other people say five years. I don't know. However long a time it takes that you get to know each other and know one another, you need to learn that you can trust in that person. And why do you get married? Because you feel like you can trust that person. So trust is key in a relationship. And uh, marriage is based upon trust. And we're supposed to trust one another. Let me show you some verses on this first. On being born again, um, when we're saved, we have that relationship of the new birth, and now we're begotten. And so we're, we're children of God. Let's go to uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 4.15. Salvation is the new birth, the Bible calls it. So when we're born into the family of God, when we're saved by faith, then begins our relationship with God. So, so faith or trust is what saves us, but then daily we're supposed to trust in the Lord and trust that He'll meet our needs. As a matter of fact, He promised in the book, He says, And my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and grace. So whatever need that I have, not wants, okay? The Bible doesn't say God will supply all my wants because I want a lot of things. I want a new sailboat. <laughs> uh, I, I need a new house. I need, I need a new hunting rifle. I, there are a lot of things that in my mind I think I need, but they're really what I want. God didn't say He'd give me what I wanted. He said He'd supply what I need. And what He said was with food and raiment there would be content. <laughs> so I'm supposed to be happy with food and clothing. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15, the Bible says, For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, ye have, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So the gospel begot us, begat us. How do you say it? We are begotten through the gospel. When we're saved by faith, by trusting, then we become a child of God or a son of God. And now, guess what? Now begins our life with Christ and our relationship with Him. And we trust Him. And he's the only person I know in this entire world that I can trust in 100% because he's not a sinner, because he can't lie, because he is God, because he is just and holy. And I can trust his holy word in everything he says. So it's a relationship. Now let's go to 2 Corinthians 11.2. When we're saved, we become part of the body of Christ. And the Bible in Ephesians chapter 5 talks about the body of Christ as, as a bride and how Christ is a type of the husband and the wife or the bride, the church, is a type of the wife. Well, look at what Paul says. He makes it very clear in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, when he says this, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He's talking to the church. He's talking to the body of Christ. Paul says, look, I've espoused you as a virgin to Christ. Now, an espousal is saying, I give this woman to wed. So we are, like the word in, in Spanish is novia. <laughs> novia is a uh, fiance, basically. We are Christ's fiance. What happens at the rapture? We go up at the rapture, the body of Christ, the bride goes up, but she's not the bride yet. She's a spouse, and she goes up to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that's when we marry Christ. And so that's where our relationship comes in with Christ. It's like being married. Well, like I say, you don't marry someone that you don't trust. Trust is key and essential to a relationship. So trust is something that is important, and God wants trust from us. He wants our trust. So you trust your parents when you're young, and you don't marry someone unless you trust them. And sadly, a lot of marriages have ended because of a lack of trust. A man will go and cheat on his wife, or a woman will go and cheat on her husband, and they lose trust. Well, even if that happens, and that's a horrible thing that should never happen, I do want you to remember that the Bible says that Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Uh, the marriage proposal that God makes to us, if you will, is this is for life. Did you know marriage is for life? You know when you stand up there and you make your vows before a man that's supposed to be a man of the cloth? You're making your vows to each other and to God. And one of the vows is till death do us part. Marriage is for life. God never had a plan in his book of divorce. In fact, God says he hates putting away. That's a quote from the King James Bible. God hateth putting away. God hates divorce. Jesus said from the beginning it was not so. Moses gave you writing a divorcement. But God says he doesn't want you to get divorced. God hates divorce. So we are never supposed to in this life get divorced. God doesn't want it. 
unless, of course, your husband dies. That's the vow, till death do us part, or your wife dies. Then you can remarry. But why is God so adamant about that? Why is that so important? Because that's a type of our relationship to God. And God said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake you. If you're saved, God will never divorce you. That's called eternal security. He gives us eternal life. And basically, when we're saved, it's till eternal life do us part. Well, there's no end to eternal life. That's why it's called eternal life. It's life for all eternity. So we can't lose salvation. And that's why you can't walk away from God and say, well, I make up my mind. I don't want to be saved anymore. And you walk away. No, once saved, always saved, the Bible says. Now, you can be unfaithful. You can be backslidden. You can be bad. And you shouldn't. But once you're saved, the Bible says your soul belongs to God. And actually, that's where I want to go next. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. And so when we're saved, well, we're a part of the body of Christ, which is the, the, the fiancé of Christ, if you will, that's a spouse to Christ, to be married to Christ. But it's almost like we're married to Him already when we're saved. Uh, and I don't have time to get in, into all that, but if you look at how Joseph was a spouse to Mary... It was like they were married, and they did everything except for the sexual relation. They went together before Jesus was born. They had espoused each other. They were espoused. Anyway, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 12. That we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. Salvation is trusting in Christ. Verse 13, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Notice it says, whom ye also trusted. What do you trust in? The word of truth, the gospel. We trust in the gospel. In whom after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. So salvation is by trusting, trusting in the gospel. And when you trust, that's when you believe, that's when you're saved. And now we're redeemed, we're purchased, a purchased possession. I don't know if you remember the book of Ruth, but in the marriage relationship, remember where it says that Boaz purchased Ruth? He mar married her, but he had to purchase her. In the Old Testament, like if a guy wanted to get married, well, there was what's called a dowry, and he had to literally pay the father for, for the daughter. It's a redemption. It's, it's bought and paid for. So, in the Bible, salvation is by trust. Now, there's a video that came out not too long ago, and I just recently gave it to someone. It's called Before the Wrath, I believe is the name of it. By um, Well, I forget who put it out, but it's, uh, it's, its narrator is Kevin Sorbo, and it's called Before the Wrath. And they found all these things and documents about ancient Galilee, when Jesus went to Galilee, and they found what the marriage proposal was and everything. And how if a man wanted to marry a wife, he would go to that woman with a cup, and in front of all the people at the gate of the city, he would offer that cup of wine. Now, wine in the Bible, there's two types of wine. There's fermented liquor, and we call, today we call that wine. But in the Bible, there's also unfermented liquor, grape juice. And grape juice in the Bible is called wine. So oftentimes when they're drinking what they say is wine, it's grape juice. It's not the fermented type. And I don't have time to get into that. But the custom in Galilee was when a man wanted to marry a woman, he would come out before all the people and say, I want to marry you, I offer you this cup. Take and drink this cup. If she wanted to marry him, if she believed that she trusted him enough that she would want to spend the rest of her life, then before all the people, she would take the cup and she would drink it. And she has shown to all the people, I accept your marriage proposal. And then he would go away, and then the father of that man would decide when the wedding was, and he would come. And it's an interesting, if you get a chance to watch that or get that, I found it quite interesting, because what is wine? Why, it's a type of blood. How are we saved today? Through the blood. God offers us the blood. He says, now, will you take me? Will you trust me? Will you accept me? Here's the blood that I shed for you. Will you, will you receive that? Will you put your faith in the blood? I just found that quite interesting. So in the Bible, trust is a type of when you're born, trusting your parents. Well, born again, we trust in God, but also uh, it's a type of, of a marriage relationship. I find that very interesting. So, trust. What is trust? Trust is relying on something or resting in something or trusting and believing in. And there's an acceptance involved. It's uh, by trusting someone, you're accepting someone. Not accepting, E-X-C-E-P-T. No, accepting, A-C-C-E-P-T. Accepting. So trusting is the way that God says that we're saved and we accept. Well, let me give you one more verse I forgot. Let's go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 31. 
Um, when you're married, like I said, marriage is based upon trust. So there should be some trust in the marriage relationship. And well, you wouldn't get married unless you trusted him enough to know that I, I can trust this person. But look what it says about a man trusting his wife. Proverbs 31 and verse 11. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. So a good relationship is based upon trust. And marriage is supposed to be based upon trust. We that are Christians, we don't become Christians until we trust Christ. Then we trust Him daily to take care of us. And He should be able to trust in us. We should be mature Christians who serve Him and do right and live for Him. So trusting. Salvation is by faith or by trusting. Trusting in what? Well, let's go to Romans 3.25. I kind of gave it away with that little uh, illustration about the blood in the cup or the wine, not blood. But uh, well, it's a type of blood. You've got to trust the blood of Jesus for salvation. And that's what I want to do is I want to talk about trusting today in the sense of getting saved. Romans 3.25 says, Whom God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Faith is trust. Trust is faith. Faith is believing. Trust is believing. They're all used interchangeably in the Bible. So to trust, to believe, and to practice faith, to have faith, that's all the same thing in the Bible, and it's used interchangeably. And I want to show you some verses on that. Uh, recently, someone told me there's some people on the internet going around saying, well, faith and trust aren't the same thing, and belief and faith aren't the And it's just like, I don't know these people, but I know one thing, they don't know their Bible. Because I don't see how you can read the Bible and not see that the Bible says we're saved by faith. The Bible says, after whom you trusted. <laughs> the Bible says, believe, and you're saved. So we're saved by faith. We're saved by trusting in the gospel. We're saved by believing, by faith. They're all the same thing. They're used interchangeably in the Bible. Let me just give you a couple illustrations. Trust is to believe. Let's go to Acts 16, 30 and verse 31. So we're saved by trusting. I showed you the verse in Ephesians 1, 13, in whom you also trusted. After that, you believed. So trust is to believe. And what is it who you also trusted? You trusted the gospel. So salvation is by trusting trusting the gospel. Acts 16.30, there's a question given. A question by a man, and the man asks about salvation. And he says, Sirs, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, and they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, comma, and thy house. It's inferred that your house needs to believe as well. Everybody needs to be. Every individual needs to be saved. But notice what he says there, belief. Trusting and believing are the same thing. And we're saved by trusting the gospel. We're saved by believing the gospel. Uh, let's look at uh, some more verses. Believing in faith. Let's go to Romans chapter 3 and verse 22. We were just there in, in verse 25. But Romans 3, 22. I want you to see that faith and belief and trust are all used interchangeably in the Bible. Romans uh, 3, 22 says this. Romans 3, 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Why, faith and belief are used in the same verse together, showing you that, hey, faith is believing. Believing is faith. Uh, let's run down to uh, verse 28. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Uh, Romans 4, 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So we're saved by faith. We're saved by belief. Uh, let's go to Galatians 3.26. Well, I think I can quote that pretty much from memory. For we are all the children of God by faith, the Bible says. So salvation is by trusting, by believing, by faith. It's all the same thing. I trust this chair to hold me up. I believe that this chair is made strong enough that it will hold me up. Uh, my faith is in this chair right now, and I'm trusting it and believing in it to hold me up. So that's faith. Salvation is by trusting. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4 and verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10. So are you placing your faith in the blood of Jesus, in the gospel? You see, the gospel is a blood-stained gospel. It's all about the death, burial, resurrection. It's all about the blood atonement of Christ. Because when he did rise again, he went up and sprinkled up in heaven his blood on the mercy seat. So the blood is all through the gospel. Faith in the gospel, trusting the gospel, believing the gospel is the way of salvation. 1 Timothy 
For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. <laughs> so we had some verses that I showed you that said faith and belief. And it's like saying those are interchangeable. Well, in this verse, it's saying that when you trust, well, that's believing. So it's used interchangeably. So to trust is to believe. To believe is to have faith in something according to to the Bible. So trust, belief, faith, all used interchangeably in the Bible. Salvation is trusting. Salvation is a persuasion. Now I didn't have time to give you the definitions of faith and belief in the 1828 dictionary, but I did look them up and I thought it was interesting because it was a persuasion. It's not only trusting or relying on something or having confidence or something, but it's being persuaded that that is true. So it's believing because you're persuaded of that thing. You're persuaded. I was persuaded when I saw this chair. I've seen enough chairs like this that, hey, I know this is going to be a good chair for me to sit in. I'm persuaded that this will hold me up, so I'm going to sit in it. And I did, and it didn't break. But I knew it wouldn't break because my faith was in it. I was believing that it wouldn't. So let's look at some verses about persuasion, okay? Because salvation is a belief. Christianity is a belief. It's a trust. It, it's, it's, it's faith in something. That's why we talk about Christianity as the Christian faith, but it's also a persuasion. I find it interesting. Years ago, I heard people talking about different religions, and uh, they came up to someone. I don't know if I was at a, uh, some sort of a pastor's conference or something, and there were all these different kinds of, of so-called Christians that had all these different beliefs. Oh, I remember what it was. It was a missions conference at a, a place down in South Florida that was a interdenominational whatever, but it was all about gardens and planting and, and plants. And it was for missionaries to, to go to a foreign field and to help people by taking livestock and plants and things like that. And so they, they said, come here, doesn't matter what denomination you are, and if you're a missionary, well, then we want to help you to help people in other countries that are starving to be able to plant their own food. And I said, well, it's interdenominational, but it is cool. I love plants. I used to have my own landscape and lawn care business, and I love seeds. And I said, you know, this would be kind of cool that while I'm down in Honduras preaching to people, I can show them how to plant gardens and, and be able to, to um, do things like that. So I went to this thing, and they, they, uh, they didn't, you know, believe like I did as far as the gospel. But it was interesting that they did all this different kind of plants. I learned so much about trees, different plants, different nutrients, different kind of animals, and, and how to raise, how to, how to do bees. I learned about how to raise bees. I never raised bees, but I learned how to do it. I thought it was interesting. Well, anyway, long story short, they would go around and say, well, what is your persuasion? What is your religious affiliation? What is your persuasion? And I just found that interesting. I never forgot that they, that they looked at Christianity and, and as, as, as a belief, and they say, what is your persuasion? They were asking, what is your denomination? Are you a Methodist? Are you Episcopalian? Are you Baptist? But, and, and they called it a persuasion. Why? Because when we're saved, it's because we're persuaded that salvation is by this and that we trust this. We're saved, so it's our persuasion. I'm persuaded that I must believe in the blood of Christ to be saved, so that's my persuasion. I believe in the blood of Jesus for salvation. So let's go to Romans 8.38. And I just find it very interesting the way Paul uses this. When you're saved, you know you're saved. Because that there's some knowledge. It's implied that you can't believe in something without knowing something. I had to know that this chair was a certain kind of a foldable chair that you sit in. And I had to know that before I could put my faith in it. Because I've seen this before. Oh, and I actually own several other of these. But this is the nicest one so far we've ever had. I think, I think we found those other ones too at the beach where somebody left them or something. But anyway, uh, Romans 8, 38. Paul says it like this. He says, I'm saved. And by the way, if you're saved by faith, if you're saved by trust, if you're saved by believing, then you know something and, and you believe in that and you know you're saved. You know, a lot of people run around and say, well, you can be saved, but you don't know it. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says being saved is like being born and like being married. I've never met anyone that goes, well, I don't know if I'm married or not. I don't remember. <laughs> no, you, you know if you're married or not. I've never, never met anyone that goes, you know, I don't know if I was ever born. Uh, just reach down and pinch yourself on the butt, and if it hurts, you've been born, you're here, you know, you don't have to doubt it. When it comes to salvation, it's a persuasion. We don't doubt if we're saved. We know we're saved because we're believing in what God said to believe in to get us to heaven, the blood of Christ. 
But Paul says it like this in Romans 8, 38. Look at how Paul talks. He doesn't say, well, I might believe and I think I may be saved, but I might not, but I'm not sure, but I may be possibly have faith, but I'm not. He doesn't talk like that. None of the apostles talk like that. They talk like this. I know that I'm saved because I'm trusting in Christ and his finished work. Romans 8, 38, Paul says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, 39, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, I am fully persuaded. I am persuaded that nothing will separate me from Christ because I'm saved by faith. That's a blessing. Now let's go over to Romans chapter 14 to verse 15. Romans 14, 15, look what Paul says. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Isn't that interesting? He says, I know and I am persuaded. Salvation is a persuasion. Are you persuaded? Let's go to 2 Timothy 1, 12. Are you of the persuasion that you know you're saved and on your way to heaven? Are you in the refuge that is Christ? Are you resting in His finished work? Are you resting in the blood of Christ for salvation? I hope so. 1 Timothy, excuse me, 2 Timothy 1.12. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. Notice what Paul says. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul says, I know that I'm saved and that my sins are forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. And I am persuaded that all my sin is under the blood and I'm going to get to heaven through the blood of Jesus Christ because the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sins. So salvation is by belief, by faith. Now, over in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. God demands faith from us. He wants our trust. He wants our belief in Him and what He did for us in order for us to be saved. That's what the Bible says we're to be saved by, by faith. So I hope you can understand what faith is. Faith is simply taking God at His word and believing what God says and believing in what God says. So the more you read the Bible, the more you'll know. Now, Real quickly, let me just run, run through a couple of verses of what the Bible tells us not to trust in. Because I want you to understand that salvation is trusting in Christ, who is God. Trusting in what He did, not in ourselves or what we do. And that's the problem with modern Christianity today. People who claim to be Christians, but what are they trusting in? They're trusting in themselves. They're trusting in their denomination. They're trusting in their religious leader. They're trusting in their works and in what they do, their baptism, their this or their that. They're trusting in themselves. They're not trusting in Christ and the gospel. That is a false convert. That is a false religious person who is not a true Christian. They use the name of Christian, they use the mouth, and they say, I'm a Christian, but they make a profession, but they have no possession of salvation because they're not trusting in Christ. They're not resting in Christ's finished work. And it's those people that I want to see get saved. But let's look at some verses in the Bible, what the Bible says not to trust in. Let's go to Deuteronomy 32, 37. There, De uh, Deuteronomy 32, 27. We're not to trust in idols or false gods. Deuteronomy 32, 37 says, And he shall say, Where are their gods? Their rock, in whom they trusted. <laughs> and here's an Old Testament passage where we find there was a lot of pagans that were trusting in a rock, in a stone idol. And they were bowing down to that idol and saying, You are my God. And that's the dumbest thing in the history of the world. How could people be so stupid? God created man. Then these pagans went as man and created their own gods. Out of stone, out of wood, out of gold, out of silver. And they bow down and said, you are my God, you are my maker, you are my creator. In the back of their head, they're like, ha ha, yo, I really created you. How could anybody be that foolish? But what's sad is that the pagans actually trusted in those idols. If you know history, you know that. 
They would go to those idols. They would bow down. They would worship them. They would literally bring sacrifices of animals and oftentimes human beings, and they would kill them to those gods. And then they tell those gods, now bring the rain. Now give me prosperity. Now give me the... And they would trust in an inanimate object. How can you trust in that? I've never understood that, and I never will. I'll never trust in false gods. Let's go to Psalms 118. The middle verses in the Bible, I say the middle verses in the Bible because the way that there are so many verses in the Bible that there's not just one in the Bible that's one verse. There's actually two verses that are the middle verses of the Bible. By the way, while I'm turning there to Psalms 118, let me just say this. Do you know what the first word in the Bible is? It's in. You know what the middle word in the Bible is? Well, it's actually two words. It's the Lord. You know what the last word in the Bible is? Amen. So if you take the first word, the middle two words, and the last words, you get a sentence that pretty much explains it all. <laughs> in the Lord. Amen. Okay, if you're saved, then you're in the Lord. And you can say amen. Are you saved? Are you in the Lord? Are you trusting in Him? Well, if you are, amen, you're saved. If you're not, then you're not in Him. It's just amazing. But that only works with the King James Bible, by the way. New versions take out words, and it messes it all up. But in Psalms 118, the middle two verses in the entire Bible are these. Eight, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Verse nine, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. So we're not supposed to place our faith in men or in politicians, if you will. A lot of folks run around and they say, oh man, if we just elect this guy, our whole world will be better. Well, yeah, but a lot of people are trusting in the man rather than God. I'd rather trust in the Lord. The people say, well, do you vote, Brother Breaker? Yeah, I vote. They say, well, who do you vote for? And I say, well, there, let me show you. Let me tell you, I don't vote for someone. When I go to vote, I vote against people that hate my Jesus. I vote against those that hate my Lord. There's a certain party in America that has voted God out of their denomination and out of their proceedings. That's the Democratic Party. Several years ago, you can look this up. They voted and they said, let's vote to never say God ever again in any of our Democratic Party proceedings. Well, if they are voting against God and they are against God, then they are against me and my Savior. So when I go to the poll, this is what I do. I don't vote for a person. I make sure my vote is always against those people who are against my God. Amen? I got a thumbs up by the guy running by. So that's why I don't vote for the Democrats, because they hate God. And today, many people in the Democratic Party are self-proclaimed Satanists. So as a Christian, it is our civic duty to vote. But I don't tell people to vote for. I tell people, just make sure you vote against the devil <laughs> and those that are in favor of the devil. And for most people, that's the Republican Party. Now, I'm an independent, but I learned a long time ago, if I vote for all the independents, well, then the Democrats will win, because so... You know, that, that's a dilemma, if you will. But I'm, I want to vote for um, God. And I feel that the way to vote for God is to vote against those that are against God. So that's my recommendation. People say, who should I vote for? Just vote against those that are against God. And the, and the country will be far better. Amen? Um, it says here in, uh, in Psalms 146 in verse 3, Put not your trust in princes nor in the sons, son of man in whom there is no help. So we're not supposed to trust in princes. What's a prince? Well, I guess you could say he's a politician. He's, he's a, a leader uh, of, of a government. Well, not a politician. So don't trust in man. My faith is not in a man. My faith is in God. But I try to, tr to vote for someone who will try to make what's best for the country. But I always make sure my vote counts because my vote is me saying, God, I'm on your side and against them that are against you. Uh, let's go to... Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 17. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. So let's don't trust in our money. A lot of people today, they trust in riches, and I find that so sad. Money, you know, is nothing, really. What we have today are just pieces of paper. Do you know that's not money? A lot of people don't know what money is, but real money is gold and silver. It's even in the Constitution. <laughs> gold and silver. Uh, the first time you find uh, the Bible talking about someone who is rich, it's over there in Genesis, and it says that Abraham was rich. 
and then it tells us what true riches is. He was rich in gold, silver, and cattle. True riches are something that's tangible and real and that can produce something. Paper isn't money. But people today have been duped into thinking that a piece of paper, a debt note, is money. It's not. Gold and silver is real money. Now they're changing money to just zeros on a computer. That's not real money. That's just zeros. A zero is worthless, but yet you're told to think it means something. <laughs> and the more zeros you put on something, the more supposedly it's worth. It makes no sense to me. The other thing that you should never trust in, Proverbs 28, 26, is yourself. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, and whosoever walketh wisely shall be delivered. Don't trust in yourself. Don't trust in what you do. A lot of people in this world are trusting in themselves and thinking they can get to heaven based upon what they do. And in their heart, they think, well, I deserve to go to heaven because I've done this and I've done that. and I've done... That's foolishness, the Bible says. It's not what you do that gets you to heaven. It's whether or not you've trusted in what Jesus did. That's what it all boils down to. Have you trusted in Christ? Have you trusted in the blood atonement? Have you trusted in what Jesus did to get you to heaven? Or are you trusting in something that you do? If you're trusting in what you do, you're trusting in vain. You're trusting in vanity. You're trusting in yourself. And all you are is a sinner. And the best you can do is still something a sinner did. Do you really think God is pleased with that? God says without faith it's impossible to please Him. The only thing that pleases God is whether or not you've trusted in Him. Psalms 112 and verse 7. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. I find that a really interesting verse. I get emails a lot and phone calls from people that just say, I'm in agony, my heart hurts, I want to find Christ, I want to believe, I want to understand, I want to get saved. And I try to tell them, the answer is the Bible, the answer is God. Get in this book, the more you read this book, the more you'll understand. And the answer is faith, believing. If you want your heart fixed, the only way to fix your heart is by trusting in the Lord. I like this verse. I found this today. I said, wow, your heart fixed is only by trusting in the Lord. So are you saved? Are you trusting? Are you believing? Do you have faith? Faith in what? Well, faith in the blood we saw. But in order to get your faith in the blood, you have to first have some faith in something else. You need to trust in the Bible. Let's go to 2 Timothy. You see, the Bible tells us that God cannot lie. And the Bible tells us that God, who cannot lie, gave us His Word. This book, the Bible, the King James Bible, is the words of the living God, and it is absolute truth. And He can't lie. Boy, is it easy to trust in someone that can't lie. You know, I've met people in my life that have lied to me, and it's very hard for me to trust them after that. But to meet somebody and to know somebody that can never lie... Boy, I can be friends with them. I can have a great relationship with them because they can't lie. So I can trust anything and everything they say. And that's what God is. He's God who cannot lie. And he says here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 to 17, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, the Bible is the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. The Bible says I can believe. I can have faith. I can trust in the blood of Christ, because that's what it says in the Bible to trust in, through faith in His blood. I can trust in that if I go to the Scriptures and read that and understand that. And if God says it, then I can believe it, and I trust in it. It continues, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So do you trust in God? Well, first of all, do you believe that God exists? You know, we have to start there, really. If you believe there is a God, the Creator, then do you believe that God came down here and lived for 33 years and died in your place and shed His blood for you? Do you believe He gave us a book that told us how to be saved? Do you believe in the words of this book? Okay, then do you trust His blood? If you trust the blood, the Bible says we're saved. He's our propitiation through faith in His blood. If your faith is in the blood of Jesus, then you're saved. It's that simple. If it's not, if you're trusting in yourself, or in a man, or in a denomination, or in your baptism, or in your works, then you are just as lost as a golf ball in high weeds, and you're going to split hell wide open when you die. And I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but that's what the Bible teaches. But salvation is wonderful. It's resting in what Jesus did. 
trusting Him and resting in Him and knowing that He'll take you to heaven because of faith in the gospel, faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. So there it is. I tried to explain faith to you. I hope that helps. I tried to explain uh, trusting, and I hope you're able to, to get a hold of that. I hope this is a blessing to you. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. So I just, uh, I just finished up preaching, and boy, was it hot out there. I did English and Spanish, and uh, just, just God is so good. Amen? God is just so amazing. As I'm coming here to this park to uh, do my sermon, I set out that way. As I, as I was coming here, I said, well, I'll just turn on the radio. I turn on the radio. And it says, welcome to the International Gospel Hour, or something like this. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. I was like, hey, man, <laughs> what a great day. And then I'm out there preaching, and this guy's walking around the track out there. And every time he goes by, he starts giving me a thumbs up. So he comes up to me afterwards, and he says, my name's Brother So-and-so, and I appreciate what you're doing. And I said, well, I'm Brother So-and-so. And he says, where do you go to church? And I told him, he goes, well, I'm family with those people, and, and I go to this church over here. And I, oh, well, I know that guy. And, and we just had a good time of fellowship, and he's saved and uh, goes to a church here locally. And uh, I tell you, man, God is just so good. I woke up this morning just feeling tired and down and, and just worn out. And I said, Lord, I'm going to do my best to give this sermon today. And I just need some help. And uh, getting in the car and driving over here, God's just reminded me, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. <laughs> and that was a blessing. And then God let me meet somebody who gave me an amen and a thumbs up and as I was preaching and encouraged me. So be encouraged. We are in the last days. We're in a bad time. But there's still a lot of Christians out there. And there's still a lot of people out there that believe in God and the Bible and uh, the blood of Christ. And uh, it's a blessing that they're still out there. But we need more. We need more. Preach the blood. Preach the book. Preach the blessed hope. And uh, just do your best. God, we pray for this nation. Lord, we really want to see them uh, have one more just real revival of salvation. Please, God, please help America before you come back. Help a lot of them to get saved. And help those that are to keep preaching the gospel. That's my prayer. All right, God bless. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.